Okay, yeah, I spoke at the, uh, the last Spark Summit uh, about uh, our use of, of Spark to generate um, analytics for this um, system we have that distributes digital media internationally from our office in Los Angeles, uh, specifically to Australia Pacific region, um, Asia, and um, Europe. And um, so it worked really well for us and we're continuing to use it to generate analytics. Basically it's, it's usage, usage analytics to help us get a good idea of um, resources required. But we decided to push it further um, into the realm of uh, predicting um, the offlining. Uh, we, we had a current system. First I'll talk about just the overview. Um, problem definition, the cluster configurations we're using, the parameters that we determined were necessary to decide if a file is, is a good candidate for offlining. Uh, the MLlib libraries utilized, used several of them, found uh, really good results on one of them, so we used that, and uh, cover some of the conclusions. So, um, yeah, as I said, we distribute digital media file 24-7 uh, over the internet to cable TV country channels in countries um, in Australia, Pacific, Europe, and Asia. And these are mostly TV shows and commercials um, which are created here and they get edited and there's different versions, say, for each country, like different language tracks, different um, parts get edited as, uh, you know, as needed for each country that they get sent to. So there's a, we have a lot of files, and these files are, are big because they're, you know, half hour, hour long shows um, or commercials, which are smaller, um, and it fills up a lot of disk space, and we have a fast Isilon storage, one for each server. We have a server for APAC, Europe and Asia, and we have an, a fast Isilon storage for each one of those where the files get distributed straight to the cable TV channels for airing. And then we have a backup Isilon system, which is very large, which those files get offline to, and then we have a mass, mass storage system that stores everything when they get offline off the, uh, the big Isilon. But this is about determining or predicting which files to move from the, the local um, servers, the servers for APAC, Europe, and Asia, to the large Isilon. And those are the ones that, that fill up the fastest, that get the most um, demand and, and throughput. So it's, a, it's actually kind of a, a somewhat critical um, operation um, because if the files get removed that are needed for airing, customers are unhappy. Or if they're not, uh, you know, it, it basically the file needs to be there and needs to be available and needs to be shipped on time or our customers aren't happy. Um, so we determined multiple parameters uh, on, on what should be used to pick the candidates based on uh, institutional knowledge from uh, people like the project leader, Chris Kane, who's been there a long time and has just learned through experience what's important in determining which files are needed and which files aren't. And there was a previous system, so we had a, a backup system that we could go back and rely on if we had problems, and that made all of us feel more comfortable because having a machine learning system involved in the loop on some fairly critical piece of software, you know, running 24-7 is, you know, can, is a little, you know, it's sort of pushing the envelope a little bit. It's a little bit risky, so it was nice we had a backup system. The problem with a backup system and the reason why we want to replace it is, is very slow and really hogs a lot of resources. Basically, it was just running 24-7, scanning the, um, the local servers, and 
um, running a bunch of if-then-else checks on every single file there to decide if it should be removed or not. So this is just, you know, a real resource hog, which, which worked, but, you know, was not optimal. Um, so the cluster configurations that, that we use for um, this project are not as large as what some other people are using. I saw that mention of an 8,000 node cluster, and I was like, wow, that sounds great. But for what I'm doing, I don't really need one that big, but I do need, I do need a cluster. So I've got, for development, I've got a Linux system with 16 cores of RAM, uh, 16 cores and 16 gigs of RAM, and then I got three Mac OS systems that were previously being used for video editing and had been discarded when people got newer machines and I grabbed them and put them in my cluster. And originally it was kind of tough getting Mesos because I use Mesos as a cluster manager. Uh, it was a little tricky getting Mesos to work on the Macs. Um, there are some good instructions on how to start it up, but I found it wasn't all that stable. It would go down sometimes, even though it was really solid, always on Linux. It was a little tricky getting that to work on the Macs. And that worked fine uh, for development, but for production, we just stuck with Linux running Mesos, and that worked a lot better. And so the production system is three Linux systems uh, with 32 cores and 64 gigs of RAM each um, running Mesos inside Docker containers. And the reason why I put it in Docker was because there's other production software running on those servers, and I didn't want to install something, some library that say Mesos needed, like a, a version of a library that Mesos needed that might conflict with some production software and bring it down or make it unstable. So it was really nice to be able to install all that right into a Docker container and then have the Mesos masters and slaves each running in Docker containers and, uh, you know, helped me sleep at night and made everybody happy. So it worked really good. I really like Docker. Um, so the, the feature parameter, features, parameters that were used to, um, for the machine learning to determine offlining are the size of the file, um, you know, so if a really large file, maybe you want to remove it depending on uh, how much storage space you need to free up at a given time, or if, if you don't need that much, maybe you want to just go with small files because they're easier to bring back on in case you have to. Um, the file age being the, how long the file has been on the, on the server, um, days since the last airing, days since, since the last time that file got aired on a cable channel somewhere in the world, and days until the next airing of that file on some cable TV channel somewhere in the world. And then there is an extra factor which was used in the machine learning, but was also used outside of the machine learning, which was to remove files that have not been scheduled for more than three weeks that were on the system. Now, originally we started off with two weeks, but we found that a lot of times the, the schedules would get updated on those files. So um, even though we'd remove them after two weeks, then they'd have to be brought back on because um, suddenly they need to be aired again. But we found if we bumped that up to a three-week time period, that worked pretty well, and, and things rarely had to be brought back online after taking them offline. Um, so the first, um, first technique that I tried was uh, k-means clustering in the Spark library. And basically, you have uh, your data, and you pick these uh, centroid points, and the idea is you can get a cluster of points. And I was hoping with my data I could get a cluster that would say, this cluster is, is uh, all my candidates that are great for offlining. Um, and I spent a fair amount of time with that, but I couldn't really get a good cluster. Um, I'm not saying there's a problem with k-means clustering. I think it's just my data was maybe too complex or it just didn't fit into what, what works with k-means clusterings. Um, like I said, I tried multiple centroid points um, and I just couldn't get it to cluster, especially when I started having multiple parameters 
uh, it just was kind of too much. So I went from there to try the Naive Bayes um, classifier in the Spark library. Um, and that's based on um, Bayes' theorem, right? Where you got your prediction based on your prior training information plus your likelihood factors divided by your previous evidence. This is, the idea was kind of based on um, like spam filtering, right? So figure we can get a bunch of files that we know are offlining and we can maybe train using the naive Bayes classifier to learn more about those files and, and what those parameters were that um, make them good candidates um, for the future. Um, and it worked really well when I just used like two parameters. Um, the problem was I, I incrementally would add new features and I found that as I started adding, once I got up to like four features, the, the original feature, like say file age, um, it wasn't doing the right thing for. And so I kept going back and forth thinking like, oh, if I just get this training set right, it'll work. And, and, and it probably would have worked if I got the training set right. But I just spent a lot of time and, um, you know, just couldn't really get the results I wanted. So I decided to try um, something else. And so I moved on to the support vector machine library in Spark. And um, in case you're not familiar with uh, support vector machines, um, it basically computes an optimization problem to, c to generate a hyperplane uh, for your data that will classify it. And in my case, whether it should be the file should be offline or kept online. And, and the hyperplane will work over multiple variables. So this is really nice for what I've got because I've got multiple variables and I need a classifier that isn't necessarily a straight line or, or shows me a cluster or anything like that, but, but is much more complex and can kind of weave its way through my data. Um, and the results I got were, were quite nice. I found as I started training off um, a couple of parameters that worked with those, and then I kept adding more and more, and, and the old parameters it kept working as I added new parameters, and I was like, wow, this is really great. Um, and so I went and built um, from there an extensive um, training set, which was a combination of production data that we knew was uh, tied to files that should be offline, and then just some uh, auto-generated training data that fit criteria that um, I had gotten from you know, institutional knowledge that people said, these, these things are the right things for, for offlining. So I just generated data with that, with those parameters, and trained off that. And um, used the Spark uh, MLlib support vector machines. And with the data that I'm using, um, basically I'm reading in files from Oracle and from flat files like schedule data. And um, it trains in about an hour and um, runs offline from the system. So um, it runs once in the morning and once at night. And then I do a prediction, generate a prediction value for each media file on the system at that time and write it into HBase. I uh, basically write it to a TSV file and then bulk load it into HBase, um, which, which was nice because, at least from what I've read, if you bulk load into HBase, you get a, a nicer distribution over your cluster. And also, I didn't have to worry about versioning because sometimes our HBase would, would change. And I didn't want to necessarily update the Spark system to be in sync with the HBase. So if I just wrote out a TSV file and then bulk imported it into HBase, um, it, was, uh, it was nicer for maintenance. And um, basically, there's just a, a few of us um, doing this. So we, we needed something that was friendly to maintain. Um, right, so as I said, it was run uh, twice, twice a day. It's still running twice a day and they're stored in HBase, and then the media manager daemon, which runs 24-7, but 
it actually doesn't run, it doesn't generate, it doesn't require the amount of resources it did before when it was checking every file. Now it just runs um, like once every 20 minutes, scans all the files on each local, they're, they're, it's running on each uh, cluster, one for APAC, one for Asia, and one for Europe. So it scans, it, it, they're separate ones scanning there, and then um, looking up in HBase to get a prediction value. If the prediction value says offline it, then that file gets offline. Um, and so it doesn't have to run all the time. It runs like maybe every 20 minutes or every half hour. We have like a, a period, and it runs pretty fast. So um, that was nice, yeah, because uh, uh, we got a real performance speed up and uh, is impacting our file system a lot less as well because it's not having to, to constantly check those parameters. Um, system was run in uh, test mode for six weeks without a problem, and so we decided to switch it into production mode, and then Murphy's Law set in, and um, suddenly we found a few problems. One was, as I mentioned before, the two weeks was too short of a time period, so we switched that to three weeks. Um, and then we found that, that, then I found that uh, over a weekend, uh, my Docker containers that I was running Spark in, or running Mesos in, not Spark, I was running Mesos in, which was, you know, the cluster manager for Spark, was filling up with um, temp, temp files from Spark. So yeah, Spark's running in there as well, I'm sorry. Um, and it did crash over the weekend, and so some files should have been offline that weren't, and uh, that was a little nerve-wracking. But that problem was solved by having a cron job that basically periodically goes and looks in the Docker containers and just removes Spark temp files from previous runs. So not a big problem um, to solve. And then uh, another issue was um, web service access to HBase locked up for some reason when running in production. Never had that running in test mode, but a couple times, like over a month, it locked up. And again, that was pretty easy to solve. Just put in a timeout on, the, on a thread on the web services call, so it, if it locked up, it just would cut off the connection and then go back and reconnect. Um, and then another one was um, a real kind of more tricky because a file could be at the time the um, prediction is made in the morning or at night, uh, the schedule could be updated. Say the, the prediction is done for all the data we have on a media file at um, six in the morning, but say by eight o'clock at night, somebody updated the schedule for that file to be aired um, later on that evening, and in that case, um, the prediction is then wrong. So I had to put in a backup system that before it actually offlined a file, it went to check the schedule in Oracle to make sure the f Oracle uh, schedule had not been changed um, that day, and, and that solved that problem. So. So there were some problems, and sometimes it made people nervous, and it got taken offline a couple times, but then the problem got solved, and it got brought back online, and it's still online. So um, just kind of keeping it short and sweet here. Um, system's been running in production for some time. Um, the fine tuning, there was certainly fine tuning and bug fixing involved. Uh, it appears to be complete. The, uh, Support vector machine library in Spark is certainly doing the trick for, for this problem. Um, it's fast. Like I said, it runs in about an hour to generate, to train and generate all the predictions for all the media files we have uh, throughout our three clusters. And um, it's robust. Um, the results that I've, I, I've gotten are really good. In fact, I, I can say that None of the problems that I had were caused by results I got from the SVM, from the support vector machine. All the problems were more like uh, interface issues um, with the rest of the system. And so I, I would conclude this is a good application for machine learning, though 
you know, the, the somewhat critical aspect of the problem with, you know, these files got to be there when they're needed made it more difficult and, um, you know, but, but it works and everybody seems happy with it now and um, it's great. <laughs> so, um, any questions? I wanted to know uh, what was your training data? Uh, what, what was your training data you fit, used to uh, fit to your models, train your models? Uh, the training data you used to... Uh, how did I get my training data? Yes, you had like a manually labeled data? Or? Um, some of it was data that we got from files on the system, just collect going in examining when they're getting scheduled and how old they are and how big they are. Um, so based on that, and then some automatically generated based on um, institutional knowledge from people that had been there a while and had determined what they thought was, were good examples to use. So did you have like historical data or? Uh... Um, so, well, that, that was kind of like the institutional data. No, we didn't really have historical data, it was more the institutional knowledge of individuals was the, like the historical data. So it was, uh, you know, gut level historical data, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> All right, another one here, he's close. Yeah, maybe a follow up on this, I'm not quite clear, Did you, your, your goal is to find the best files to, to send and files to take off the system. So you're, you're using got data, like, I guess, but how do you test, the, what, what exactly are you testing? Uh, I'm not quite clear. Oh, how if do people I know if like to watch the show, is that, is it, well, what are you testing? How do I know if it's working? Yes. Um, well, I know if it's working if the cluster doesn't fill up with files, and if files that are being taken offline are not ones that need to be aired. That's how I know. As long as there's no interruption in broadcasting, then it's working. And as long as there's space on the file system so that new files can be added as needed, then it's working. Because it, it, when it wasn't working, it, would, it fills up really fast. Um, so I had a question about the data points that you had. So as, I, as you said, you run twice a day, right? this particular program. So how many data points did you have in your training set? How many in my training set? Yep. Um, I would say, you know, uh, thousands to tens of thousands. I don't know exactly, but a lot, because I was generating a lot. Um, was it running combinedly for the three um, areas that you mentioned, Asia, APEC, and Europe, or something? I mean, what I want to know is that how, how better was this SVM performing over the data set? I mean, it was actually Oh, you're large. saying, is it, does it work differently for each system? Yeah, something like uh, that. No, I found it generally the, the training data and the parameters worked, this worked good for each system. I didn't have to change it for each one. And it was close to 10,000 data points per run, right? That's what you just mentioned? Roughly, yeah. You know, between 1,000 and 10,000, something like that. More, more, well, maybe say between 5,000 and 10,000. Because there's a lot of files in there, like hundreds of terabytes. Got it. Thanks. That's all. Hi. Uh, can you give us some more idea of the scale of the system? How many broadcasters uh, versus, you know, how many media files total? Um, how many, how many like cable channels are we distributing to? Is that what you want to know? Yeah, roughly. Um, you got, you're hundreds. Three, three systems in the cluster. Hundreds right? of cable channels around the world. Um, media files, thousands, from say like, you know, 1,000 to 10,000. Fair amount. Okay, thanks. Uh, how did you evaluate this result? I'm sorry, don't. Uh, 
How did you evaluate uh, these results? How do I evaluate the results? Um, yeah, as I was saying before, basically, as long as it keeps clearing off files that um, are not needed to be scheduled um, and makes room for new files that do need to be scheduled, um, then I can say it's working. As long as we get the throughput we needed and we have the file uh, system availability, excuse me, for new files, then that means it works. I've got like a, a two question thing. The first one would be um, the, the institutional gut data that you had, right? How did you go about gathering that data? Was it like a, a survey that you sent out to knowledgeable people in the institution that had you know, the gut feeling uh, to fill that out and to give you the data? And now that you actually have all of that and your model's working and it's, it's generating new data, have you, have you been implementing anything that you found throughout the process and, and uh, through the algorithms that's being run to retrain the model and make it more efficient? Um, no, I haven't. Um, but that's probably, that would probably be a good idea to do that. Um, so far, I just was focusing on fixing immediate problems. Um, and because the prediction values were always working for me, um, I didn't focus on trying to improve the model. But yeah, I, I, over time, I could collect new data and, and improve the model, yeah. Oh, how did I gather the original data? Basically, um, by um, looking up in uh, Oracle, there's his, some historical data in Oracle and also current data, you know, like I can look and see how big the file is. I can look and see when it got written, how long it's been on the disk, you know, what the date is there. Um, and, and in terms of Oracle, I can look up and see when that file was last aired. Okay, one, one last question here. Uh, as the system determined what needed to be offline, off your clusters, what was the integration point of once that decision was made to actually move those files? Did you, does the Spark system do that or was another in integration point that triggered some other process to move those to offline? Right, yeah, no, so the Spark is not um, in the loop at, at real time when the files are being offline. Spark, Spark is run as a separate process once in the morning and once at night and then the prediction data from those Spark runs are written to HBase, but then at, at real time during the day when the media manager is looking at the cluster to offline files, then it look, just looks up in HBase, and if it says can be offline, then it, then it does the offline. Okay, thanks Chris, Thank great you. talk. Great.